podcast you know, the internet if the opening frame of this if the if the 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 thumbnail is that opening frame. I look like a pig with my, like with a snout, the way I was holding that coffee mug. Yep. It's fantastic. So uh, if you can choose, that might be a good one. Okay. If you can't choose. I, I, I will, I I will definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, you threw me off. Uh, I'm here with, as always, uh, Mr. Binary Gary. Gary uh, on, in real life, Binary Gary on the internet. Uh, not Mr. Generally. Uh, I mean, not on the internet when you're typing it in. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Allison, here's Allison Plus on the internet. And we are uh, a podcast. Uh, Where are we? Yeah, that, that happens every so often. <laughs> Periodically. Typically, yeah, typically uh, we have a topic and we talk about it. Or avoid talking talking about it, and then at the end we find out uh, exactly uh, what that topic was that we didn't. Can I can I start with something a little weird before we do the topic? Nothing. Nothing is weird. (laughs) This one's weirder than most. We finished um, last week with me pontificating and carrying on about how I was going to step outside on Friday night and stare into the stars and be bowled over by the nothingness that was out there. Uh, and I had a very starkly different, uh, Friday, uh, my spouse was very ill and, uh, trip to the ER. And I'm just now realizing as I talk to you that that was like a thing circled on my calendar on Friday evening after our, our last hangout that I, that just, I clearly went entirely out the window. Uh, that's it. That's the entire thought. But if you're listening to two episodes back to back, I uh, I did not make it outside to stare into the nothing and feel small. I felt small in other ways. So that's that. The universe was like, he doesn't need to see the stars. We can prove this in a different way. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I, that Sorry. is not lost on me at all. I mean, that like that's not lost on me at all. Uh, yeah. Well, I hope you get to look yeah. at the stars this week, at least. I mean, I'm sure that I have. They're since always then. there, right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure that I have since then, but but that was gearing up to be a pretty impressive bout with them, <laughs> and then I missed it, or it came in a completely different way. It's if if I were if I were uh, if I were uh, absolutely off my rocker, and I'm not certain that I'm not, <laughs> I would posit that there was some relation of intensity that that caused the, a ripple of sorts. I'm not positing that, but I'm also not saying it's not <laughs> possible in some wrinkle of time. A wrinkle in time. Maybe not that. Maybe that's not the right. Maybe the maybe a wave. I love those books, though. As a side note, Wrinkle in Time. Yeah. Series. <laughs> yeah. I uh, recently learned. I was. Uh, I had a backup <laughs> for uh, the holidays. I got this strange object which transforms into different oh, things. Oh, I love those. Yeah. I haven't seen one that's, um, uh, what shape is that? Hexagonal or parallelogram? Uh, dodecahedron. I've seen it. It was a dodecahedron. Thank you. I've definitely felt it or felt it. I've had the cubicle. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, I got this thing. And as I was playing with it, uh, I had the idea. There we go. Back into the dodecahedron. Uh, I had the idea that um, this would be a really interesting sort of bizarre uh, otherworldly kind of cosmic horror-ish uh, monster to throw into a D&D campaign. Just like this thing right here, this object, but like personified. Uh, so I went about creating that creature. Uh, and then I was like, okay, what do I call this thing? Right. 
Uh, I could call it a dodecahedron, but that's that's boring. And also, like, I wanted it to be actually able to change shape uh, and to sort of fill the space. And so then I started um, uh, then I started uh, looking at at calling it uh, oh what is it the I have it I have it where is it um, the the that's on my hard drive the tetra not the tetrahedron tetrahedron is that what I called it. Um, which has roots in other things. Um, let me make sure that that's what I called it. Could I have it saved? Tesseract. Tesseract is what I, Tesseract. Oh, okay. But Tesseract has other connotations, right? There's a Tesseract in uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, where it's sort of just an object of power that is uh, just a weird cosmic shape that like is used in space travel sort of things. Uh, and then, and then I learned that there's a tesseract in uh, a wrinkle in time uh, that is how people travel through time or dimensions or space or I, all of the above. Um, what a tesseract actually is is a sort of hypothetical concept of a shape contained within a shape. Um, so, like a, a cube oh. out of a cube is what an actual tesseract is. And I decided I I, I fought with it a little bit, um, like. Okay, well, there's all these existing meanings. I knew off the top of my head the the MCU one because they talk about it in Agents of Shield a lot, uh, which I happened to be watching. Um, but then learning that it was learning actually learning that Madame, Madame uh, Madeline Madame Madeline Lengel, uh used it in her books actually kind of made me ease back a little bit. Well, okay, well it's not just MCU. It's not just Agents of Shield and that sort of stuff. If she's using it, maybe I could use it too. So, so uh, my monster that is this thing uh, is a tesseract. Um, that that's my that's my tie into your. Honestly, uh, I've never seen. I, I wouldn't have even connected it to Marvel. I only know, <laughs> only know wrinkle of time. I started watching Stargate, the TV show, the other. Oh yeah, TV yeah, show yeah. the other day. Doesn't hold up. Hey. I also stopped watching it the same day. <laughs> It's all right. You have to get. You have to give it a couple episodes. I think still. Um, nah, I'm good. We watched. We started watching with the kids. It's definitely. It's definitely aged. Um, there are, yeah. and there's definitely moments where it's like, yeah, that's sexist. Um, <laughs> I honestly think that was the part that uh, surprised me the most in the first episode. I'm like, like the sexism. I was yes. I was very taken aback by it. Yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I kind of expected that, um, but they do. What year did that come out? Nineties, early nineties. The TV, the, the t- TV shows were very different in the nineties. Like, we as a culture are very different in the. Um, but uh, they do make comments on the sexism while still reinforcing the sexism, and it's the comments on the sexism that I appreciate because. Um, Samantha Carter still is a role model for women and a strong female character and doesn't still doesn't take shit and is still very good at her job and is constantly having to prove that that is the case. And that is, you know, a real struggle. And like it, it's 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 shown in the show uh, a number of times, um, but mm-hmm. that. That also doesn't mean that she's not a uh, arguably less important character to the overall plot arc. The le- and it, sometimes there to just reinforce. I mean, it's, it's all the all the sexist tropes that are in television. She's there for those things too, um, but they also occasionally make it make uh, use her to make a point on sexism in in various. So like I don't know. Like it's 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 it it, it, it I don't know. It's, it's, it's not, not good best, enough, but but it it makes an attempt. Yeah. Okay. The '90s were a different time. I guess that's what we can settle on. Yeah. I I just can't imagine the opening episode <laughs> uh, in a series today. I mean. So. Yeah. No. Maybe that's well, a good thing, but honestly. Honestly, we wanted to, we started watching no. SG One uh, because we wanted to get to Atlantis. <sighs> Uh, and you, it's yeah. hard, it's hard to justify watching Stargate Atlantis without watching SG one, because like, there's all this run up and then they finally find Atlantis. Like, you know, like you can't just start in the middle of the story. Um, uh, but Atlantis is so much better. <laughs> found it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And Finally, we'll rewatch TNG. That was this. That's where I met. <laughs> yeah, we haven't. Aaron, Aaron doesn't have the sort of uh, uh, social context context for like uh, Star Trek to be able to mm. appreciate it from like later, and so anything that's about Star Trek. Or like, and a lot of, it's a lot of, it's not just Star Trek, it's a lot of things from the same sort of era, um, which is like our childhood, where we watched it, we didn't like have this like, you know, like, oh, I remember, and like, there's none of I that. I didn't watch uh, Star Trek when I was a kid. I Star, Trek, Star Trek. TNG was uh, a much later occurrence in my life. I'm glad it was. It's fantastic. I watched, I watched the original Star Trek. I remember watching that with my dad, reruns of, uh, and then I watched uh, Next Generation when it was on TV when I could, like I would. It's one of those short shows that I think I stayed up uh, secretly in the bedroom with the black and white TV. I had a black and white TV. Like, just let's just take a moment to appreciate <laughs> the fact that as a, a in like middle school uh, and maybe even and I think even in in uh, I don't, maybe not in high school, but definitely in middle school, um, I had a black and white television in my room. Like, yeah, that was. Um... It. And you also had a landline phone in your house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In one location. Mm -hmm. No caller ID. Two locations, no caller ID. Yeah. Uh, I did. It actually, there was, there was a, we found out later, there was a, there was a, a port on the wall in my bedroom that was in fact uh, for a phone line, but we didn't realize that at first. Because it was one of those like four pronged hole things. Mm. Yeah. So it was just like, there's, there's this weird plug in the wall. Like, what is that? And I only found out uh, when I found like an adapter uh, that turns it into an actual phone line in a different room. I'm like, oh, so I don't need to string this phone cable, this 60 foot phone cable that I got from Radio Shack the across the house to plug it into my computer. I can just, I can just take that thing out of the room and, that 60 stick it in here, and then put it back when I'm 20 done. Bucks. And that adapter was on clearance during my entire career at Radio Shack for 97 cents, and we sold the hell out of them. They must have had a stock of billions of those things. And uh, It was never out of stock. It was always on clearance. They were trying to get rid of the last of them, and yeah. I sold tons of them, and I would get tons more in boxes and put them on the shelf and keep <laughs> selling them to old people. What is going on? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, How many four-port things are there in this city that we would sell? <laughs> I, a lot. They all have to have adapters at this point. I've sold so many. Every single one needs to be adapted. <laughs> um, yeah, we only had one. We only had one of those adapters. And I stole it from the middle bedroom that was attached to, like, there. the way that our house uh, was built was weird because they, like, added onto the back, at, like, later. So there was, like, it was, it was originally a two-bedroom. Uh, and like the two bedrooms are separated <laughs> and whatever. And then they built a third bedroom that's sort of attached to the second bedroom, you know? So you have like my bedroom, middle bedroom, and then there's a door that goes into the master bedroom um, from the middle bedroom. So like you have to like, yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a guest room, but it's also kind of not. And it's kind of like maybe some other weird room and they didn't really ever use it. So anyway, there's, there's one of those adapters in there and I stole it from there and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put it back when I'm done. They never noticed. So I just kept it in my room and then I got the cable and I plugged it in. They didn't even, they didn't even notice any of that. I was like, all of a sudden I was like, how to, you know, my computer could connect to the internet and okay. Maybe they did. I'm sure um, they did. But, but. They were like, this isn't the, this and isn't the hill we're going to die on. Yeah. And then, and yeah. then I could, I could do the caller ID because then I had some stupid, like I downloaded all sorts of stupid freeware phone apps. I'm like, oh yeah, like, like now I can see who's calling and I can have like a, 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 a voice recording service when an incoming call comes in and like do really weird things. And I could do like, you could dial numbers and get a different message, like all sorts of ridiculous, really stupid crap that we did on the internet. I was, that so was today's topic. topic. Chris is bringing the topic today. Yeah, I have a topic. Uh, the topic today is Charles Ramsey. Oh, Charles so Ramsey <laughs> <laughs> sounds so familiar in the way that any name could sound familiar to me. At this I, point. Yeah, I was like, it's Gordon Ramsey's cousin. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, that's not. 
Well, I mean, I, unfortunately, I just I just spoiled it. It's not Gordon Ramsay's cousin. <sighs> Maybe it's a second cousin. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There we go. Um. Oh, it's his brother. <laughs> is it? It's just. I guess for clarification, it is actually a person. Probably. <laughs> What would, you like to, mean? would you like to roll for that? <laughs> make, an in, make an insight check. <laughs> By the way, have I recommended Lupin to you two yet? It's a uh, heist thing on Roll a 20 sided dice. 19 this time. 19? Yeah. That's a, that's a good roll. <laughs> what doesn't your watch do? And? Um. Well, I could actually probably ask it what a Charles Ramsey is. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, I hope it didn't hear me. No, it didn't. It, yeah, That'd be it, hysterical. It, yeah. Um, Lupin, uh, that is a television show or is it a movie? It's a television show. It's five, it's like five or six episodes. I think it's five hours total um, on I've Netflix. It. It's, it's French, so there's subtitles. I think they have the dubbed version too. Oh, is that um, the one... Um... Like, I think I've seen, I think I watched the trailer for it, or at least the stupid Netflix preview thing that it shows you. Um, mm. It's got like, like the main character is a, a black dude. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really, I mean, like if you're into heist. Oh yeah. Things like that. It's super good. Um, so. Yeah. And they're supposedly doing a season. It was nice because it was like season one, but then they were just like small chunks and you knew there were only like five, mm-hmm. which is great like 25 <laughs> yeah yeah and you know always, there's, a season, there's a season two eventually so it's always uh like you get into these uh well, i maybe you don't get into these but i get we get into these uh korean uh korean soap operas and like you get into like the first 10 and you're like this is this is you know pretty good but like after like you get to episode 13 I'm like okay it's kind of it kind of get it's, it's getting a little bit repetitive how many of these are there there's 25 there's definitely 20 there's always 25 not not always but like there's there's always more than you want there to be (laughs) yeah and in this case i felt like it made them be a lot more thoughtful about actions and dialogue because i'm just like look they need to be taken to this end point so it's like all about what will get them there and so it was just i think a better written experience Mm -hmm. as a whole i need to find a new series we just watched some reality show on clothing design that was clearly not something I would. I be. can I can recommend many Korean soap operas. Um, so yeah, marriage or mortgage, which I just saw pop up on my Netflix, and I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> I saw that as well, and I had the same reaction. Like, who who would see that title and go, oh yeah, this is exactly what I need to binge. Of I, all the like of all the like reality like shows, I was just like, that's not going to be it. That's not going to be fun. <laughs> Um, I, I can highly recommend, uh, Mystic Pop-Up Bar, uh, as, as a, as a new series. There's only one series, there's only one season. I think there's only going to be one season. It's 13 episodes. Each one is about an, is an hour long. So it is, they are long episodes. Um, like we, we, need, we, we, we constantly have the need for something shorter for when like it's late and we only want to watch like one, like half hour thing. For um, All Mankind is, uh. Yeah. It's uh, released every Friday now on Apple TV season two. Uh, and I cannot get enough of that show. I, that show is a reality I want to live in. I love everything about that show. Would it's, you characterize for all mankind as being depressing, uplifting, neutral on that? I mean, if those are two ends of a spectrum, like, like I would characterize it as neutral, neutral. Okay. There are, there are definitely parts that are, are very inspirational and uplifting, and there are parts that are depressing and sad, but I don't think it's, it's skewed one way or the other. Okay. I mean, that's sort of what Honestly, I... for me, the endorphin rush of imagining, like, this other timeline of the space program where we've been inhabiting the moon and, um, like, NASA isn't just this, like, you know jobs project that every senator is interested in with no real interest in like scientific exploration like that part is uh fun to think about in and out of episodes like what would that have really been like you know i found uh, that that a lot of the apple uh tv series are 
um, are either more on the like uplifting end or at least neutral. Um, they don't, I think they don't go dark very frequently. And I think that's an intentional choice. Oh man. I think so too. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, to that end, like, like, uh, I, I think it just fits like the Apple ethos, right? Yeah. Like, there is like a certain like celebration of, of people with an Apple. Like it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a hardware and software company, computer or whatever, but like there's still a focus on user, even like when they miss, there's still like a, uh, at least in some sections of the business, there's a, a focus on user, um, which is, I mean, I don't know. Like I was talking to an old, um, manager yesterday i have these like i've made it a point to like try and connect with some folks that i haven't spoken to and like get like a hey let's talk like four times this year and just you know people that have been influential i have not asked either of you because i talk to you usually every week (laughs) Uh, that was going to be my follow-up question i was was like fine (laughs) No, you would definitely be on my list. Um, you only want to be talking to us actually, when we're we'll recording. Be. <laughs> I just forget we're recording, honestly, most of the time. It's just a hangout for me. It's because I never listen to it. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and it won't until I decide, like, you know, some night, like, oh, we need to repl- replatform everything. And then I'll futz around with DigitalOcean or whatever. Um, oh, where was I going with this? You talked to an old manager. Yes, you can make that's factually time. accurate. Huh? Oh, um, we were discussing like the idea of making software because uh, ultimately, like, this is a thing that I, I continue to struggle with is that at the end of the day, like, no one cares about like code quality. Like, mm. no one is like, oh, I bought that app because the code quality is fantastic. Because there's no indicator of code quality from the way you interact with it. Like, that's that's just, I mean, there can be when it's bad, but when it's mediocre to good, like it's all the same. It doesn't matter. It gets the job done. Um, so like, like if that's the thing that, that ultimately is like the, the, uh, the North star in my development career, like, well, okay. It's kind of a waste of energy. Like good code is great. And I will continue to read books and, and iterate on how I write code. But ultimately like the user is, is, like a person that needs to be like central, constantly central in what we do. Uh, and so we were exploring that and how different roles um, address that differently. And one of the things he pointed out was that often you will find that uh, project owners, project managers uh, like tend to, tend to play a little safer than devs when it comes to thinking about the user. Um, because that role of ownership, they're, they're afraid to take risks, whereas devs are willing to take risks because devs are sort of accustomed to seeing failure all day long, mm-hmm. um, writing code that doesn't work and doesn't work and doesn't work. And then, oh, it works. Um, and so there's there's like inherently that, that's a, uh, it's windy and some tree with white leaves or flowers or something is just like, looks like snow sideways right now in my window. Um, so that's like part of the, uh, part of that like need for a team to have people of different disciplines, like really interacting and, uh, and coming together with that, that user focus and the net output is better than if we just, you know, wrote a product plan and went, uh, and, you know, followed the steps. Um, so it's really fascinating and useful. Uh, what a stupid metric. It was a really fascinating conversation. Like who cares if it was useful? Like, it's good to talk with him. Damn. Everything's not transactional. <laughs> that, that dovetails. I'm really in my head this week, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm like, that, that dovetails a just bit. like right here. I can't, I can't get beyond that. <laughs> that dovetails a bit into things I've been, uh, I had, I had my one-on-one with my EM yesterday and he, I was talking about um, developer advocate stuff because it's a thing that I've been, well, looking at, um, and, uh, he was like, well, what it, you know, like describe what it does. And so I kind of did and like they, they write a lot of documentation. They, they do a lot of outreach. They do a lot of talks. They do a lot of training. They do blog posts and that sort of thing. Um, 
and and so he suggested if I could find something that's sort of about the uh, what it is to be a developer advocate. Like there's all sorts of articles on like being a good lead dev or being a good project manager or being a good product owner or whatever. But like he's never or it's never crossed his radar what it means to be a developer advocate. So I like did a quick Google search, found some person who I guess is a developer advocate at Microsoft and like um, who wrote about it. And she said, this is, you know, what I do. Uh, and so I sent that, um, to him. And so I, I have, a, I, there's a lot of, yeah, there's basically developer advocates are, uh, the, the, I, I like to think of them as the in-between, like in between the developer and the user and not really part of the project. So not really part of like the, pro like somebody who's more technical and has like a, a like a developer programming background, um, uh, who can talk the talk and, and write the code and and like build on the code and needs to be able to build on the code because they're going to be breaking stuff and then fixing stuff and writing new things based on the stuff that you, the developer, are writing uh, to help you, the developer, do your job better based on what other people might need or use it for. Um, Some of I, my favorite talks have come from developer advocates because since they also have to explain things to like stakeholders or mm -hmm. potential whatever, like their level of communication is such that it just meshes better with how I think about things. Cause I'm not, even though I'm writing code, I'm not always thinking about it in that context. So just showing me, like showing me how to do something versus just like showing me the code is, is, is so beneficial. Mm -hmm. It's really hard sometimes when you're like deep into like problem solving to actually solve the wrong problem. Yeah. Like just cause it, it, it's there doesn't actually mean it needs to be solved. Like it, you could solve it, but if there's no net benefit for solving that problem, like it's wasted energy. Um, right now, I don't know how to, I mean, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say right now I'm doing a bunch of accessibility audit and corrections and to bring some websites up to speed and, um, it's amazing how all the different components are just failing. Like, oh, the plugin that so-and-so wrote doesn't, isn't up to standard. The WordPress itself is not working. This theme is garbage, like, <laughs> like everything. And it's basically like, oh, if one of these people had done their due mm. diligence, it would be so much better. <laughs> So when you said like, it doesn't matter if my code is great, I'm like, well, it kind of does because like good code is, is often like readily accessible. Um, That's a very valid point. Um, I, I, yeah, accessibility um, is, uh, is, is the, the, right now is like the capitalist drive is making it like a thought, right? And so accessibility is driven by like the business imperative to, to not give up money for, mm -hmm. for bad reasons, which is which is like such a such a non-user centric way to approach things. You know, if we are user centric, code is accessible by default. Uh, our it, interfaces, our our products are accessible by default, and and I mean that's it, it, that's clearly not the case. I mean, I, I think all of us have had a touch on accessibility work. Allison, I, I mean, you're, you're doing a ton right now. Um, and, and I mean, with that, it's like, I always struggle with that because at the end of the day, it's like, like it's, it's not fixing the product. Like it's just getting it, like it, it, it was, it, it's getting it up to, to workable. I mean, for, for vast majorities of our user base, it's, it's like, it's embarrassing sometimes to have to dig in on accessibility stuff and be like, God, I mean, people were using that. People weren't able to use this because of, uh, you know, not prioritizing it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's a yes, yes. I always feel bad when so I Charles look at accessibility stuff that I wrote. Oh yeah, I'm Charles sorry. Ramsey. Charles Ramsey oh, yeah. <laughs> was the keynote speaker at a little known conference called Gary, what was the name of that conference? Uh, Dev Advocacy for Penguins. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. Well, the big reveal. Penguins, of course, being a euphemism. The the big reveal is uh, is a a uh, multi uh, multimedia reveal. Oh. Where did my screen go? I turned off a screen, and now I don't know where you all went. Yeah. I have to turn everything back <laughs> well, on. You should, you should be able to hear. Hey, Charles. Hey, Charles, Charles, let me talk to you. I'm talking with Charles Ramsey. He's a neighbor. Uh, t walk me through again what happened this afternoon. You, were, you, you heard screaming. I heard screaming. I meet my McDonald's. I uh, come outside. I see this girl going nuts trying to get out of her house. So I go on the porch. I go on the porch. And she says, help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time. So, you know, I figured it's a, a domestic violence dispute. So I open the door and we can't get in that way because how the door is, it's so much that the body can't fit through, only your hand. So we click kick the bottom and she comes out with the little girl and she says, call 911. My name was Amanda Berry. Now, did you know who that was when, you, when she said that? When she told me it didn't register until I got the call in 911. And then I'm like, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Berry? I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? And, and she got on the phone and she said, yes, this is me. And the detective, uh, Cook, Cook, right here. Detective Gregory Cook says, Charles, do you know who you rescued? I said, I said. Now, and when did you see, when did you see Gina? About, about, about five. We're good. So about five minutes after the police got here, see the girl Amanda, told the police, I ain't just the only ones, it's some more girls up in that house. So they went up there, you know, 30, 40 deep, and when they came out was just astonishing, because I thought they were gonna come up with nothing. I figured, I mean, whoever she was, and like I say, my neighbor, uh, you, you got you got the, some big testicles to pull this off, bro, because we see this dude every day. I mean, every day. How long have you lived here? I've been here a year. Okay. You see where I'm coming from? Right. I barbecue with, with this dude. We eat ribs and, and whatnot and listen to salsa music. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. And you had no indication that there was not anything going on? bro, not a clue that that girl w was in that house or anybody else was in there against their will. Because how he is, is I just, he just comes out to his backyard, plays with the dogs, tinker with his cars and motorcycles, goes back in the house. So he's somebody that you look and you look away because he's not doing nothing but the, the average stuff. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Nothing exciting about him. Well, until the day. <laughs> what, was, what was the reaction on the girls' faces? I can't imagine to see the sunlight to be Bro, around. Bro, I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arms. Something is wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead Charles, giveaway. Charles, thank you very Dead much. Dead giveaway. Thank you very much for your time. And either she's homeless or she got problems. That's the only reason why she ran to a black man. Charles, thank, thank you for being there, man. Charles Ramsey, neighbor. Heard the screaming. Took action. So what brought this up? Uh, there was a Quora question that was uh, about the most accidentally famous person. Uh, mm -hmm. and the answer was Charles Ramsey. And what happened after that? So the, the deal was there's this dude that had kidnapped three women and was sexually abusing them. And they had babies and they were living in like an attic, I think, and just locked, they're trapped in there. Uh, and, and the one ran, the one escaped and he was the next door neighbor and she's like, she's screaming to, to let him out to let her out. And he goes over to see what's going on and he kicks open the door and she comes out and, and then he becomes the person that, that, that calls at 911 and, and whatever. Um, so what happens after that is uh, Snoop Dogg uh, gets a hold of the 911 call that he made. Uh, and on the 911 call, it has his phone number and, um, and he's broadcasting the the 911 call so it's not so he ends up he ends up calling uh charles ramsey and but the phone number is out there now because he just did it and so he gets like so many he gets inundated with calls um like the when snoop calls there's some dude that's like he hasn't gotten any sleep but because you're calling because it's you snoop then we'll let you through and you can talk with him for a little bit um he ended up i guess chucking his uh his phone into the lake um because he got so many calls um, because he was talking about McDonald's, McDonald's sent him like a crap ton of $50 gift certificates, which he gave to kids and homeless people and stuff. Um, and, uh, Snoop, the, the, the Snoop interview is really good. And I don't think we have time to, to watch that. So I'll put it in the show notes, uh, and drop it in the Slack, uh, because Snoop, uh, uh, he goes, uh, it's, it's very entertaining for, for a variety of reasons. And also just because it's Snoop and Snoop is awesome.
Um, but uh, but yeah, so that's that's what that's what brought on Gordon, uh, not Gordon, Charles Ramsey. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know that I even knew that that was a thing or didn't remember it uh, when, if it was a thing, I mean, it's a Cleveland thing. So it's not something that's local to me. I was about to ask what city it's a place in. Yeah. Cleveland. I don't call it. Apparently Cleveland rocks. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Having been there, my uncle used to uh, volunteer at the uh, Cleveland Natural History Museum. So Cleveland rocks. I mean, he, that was what he did. He did like rock specimen ident- identification at his own desk in the back. And so when I was a teenager, Cleveland, rocks. I went up there for a week. Uh, he lives with my grandparents. Uh, he was one that had, had, had a stroke when he was younger. So I went up there and one day he and I, uh, so he wasn't able to drive. So we hopped on public transit, which for me as a teenager was just like super cool that we could take a train in before he got on a bus to get to where we we're going or bus to train, whatever. Um, and then he knew like the shortcuts through the city to get to the, museum and uh we went in there and he took me to his desk in the back with, that was i mean a covered in dirt and rocks and brushes and little magnifying lenses and like dental picks and all sorts of fascinating stuff and at the time um uh the uh lucy the uh skeleton of i don't even know what ancient relative of us it is but lucy was on display thank you um i mean so it was uh it was fascinating and just what he did because he didn't have anything to do you know couldn't work and so he volunteered and identified thousands and thousands of specimens for both the cleveland museum of natural history and other museums and sent them back out i don't know rocks could be so interesting rocks are pretty cool Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at @binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.